everybody. Um, we're going to just give a minute for everybody to connect. But um, thank you for attending. Um, so looks like there's still a couple of people connecting. Um, but yeah, so uh, my name is Brandon. Um, I'm the coordinator for the psychology department. Um, I was a uh, master's student in the forensic psychology program. Um, so I'll be kind of uh, the MC for today. Um, but, but yeah, so I guess looks like everyone's almost done connecting. So I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, so thank you all for attending. Um, I know you're all very excited to hear from the panelists. So I won't take up too much time. Um, so I just, so basically what we're gonna do is we're gonna have them all introduce themselves and uh, ask, ask some questions. So, um, so Chelsea and Rada are actually, uh, they have to leave a bit early today. So we're gonna have them go first. Um, so first let's go ahead and introduce Rada. Um, hi everyone, uh, my name is Radha. I am in the clinical psych PhD program at John Jay. Uh, this is my first year in the program. Um, happy to be here. Um, I'll just go over some information about um, like how I got to this, um, this point in my academic career. Um, and then you can let me know if you have any questions. Uh, I graduated from undergrad in 2018 from UW-Madison. Um, I did my majors in neurobio and psych, and um, I my long-term goal was doing a clinical psych PhD, but I wanted to take some time off first. Um, so I worked as a clinical research coordinator for a couple of years after, after I graduated, um, which like really strengthened my application. Um, and then I applied. So I actually applied to grad school right out of undergrad. Uh, didn't get any interviews, didn't get in anywhere. Um, and then I, so I worked for two years. And then after I worked, um, I like got interviews and of course I got in. So that was exciting. Um, so I just mentioned that because I feel like sometimes people think that like if you apply and then you don't get in, that just means that you're not cut out for it and that you should just find something else to do. But um, you can just keep trying until it works, uh, which is what I planned to do. But um, I can go over like sort of more general information or I can just allow people to ask questions. Brandon, do you have a preference either way? Um, maybe a little bit of general information and then open it up to questions. Sure, sure. Um, so I also, um, I don't know if this applies to any of you here, but um, I'm like technically an international student because of just visa status and things like that. And so um, that has added sort of a layer of complexity to, to the whole um, academic and PhD process. So if that's relevant to any of you, I'd be happy to answer any questions about that as well. Um, but otherwise, I would just say that like my sort of biggest indication that I wanted to do a clinical psych PhD specifically was um, my interest in doing research and also clinical work. I know that it can be hard with clinical psych, especially or like related fields, because there's seems like it's so there's so many options. Like you could do a master's in counseling psych, you could do a PhD in counseling psych, PhD in clinical psych, PsyD in clinical psych. Um, but but there's definitely um, like I think pretty clear sort of pathways for which would be the best for you based on your interests. Um, and so, so I can talk about that too, like which would be appro appropriate for people. Um, that's a great question. Um, I saw that. So I, um, I'm like 95% sure that yes, uh, there's just in applications, you have to put in information about um, like residency for tuition purposes and tax purposes. Um, but that I've never had to submit like any sort of like documentation or anything like that prior to um, actually attending, like prior to the start of the program. Um, so yeah. Uh, great question. Um, so, I mean, financially it's, I'm not gonna lie, it's really tough. Um, it's, you know, like student stipends um, sort of get you, get you there. You can make it work for sure, but um, they don't leave you a lot of buffer. This is a big difference between PhD programs and PsyD programs is that PhD programs are normally 
fully funded, which means that they'll come with tuition remission, which means you don't pay tuition, and also a stipend um, that, depending on the program, will be like yearly or they could guarantee for like the entire time that you're there. Um, and so, so that's an important thing to look into um, when you're choosing places to apply to because um, for me, like I wasn't going to be able to go to grad school if I wasn't going to have a stipend. And so, um, so I was able to like make sure that the places that I was applying for um, had those things offered. Um, any, if you have any other questions, you can throw them in the chat or unmute or I can share more or we can move on to a different person, whatever would be best. Yeah, if you have a question, feel free to uh, put like use a little like hand up emoji. Yes. Um, that way. Um, I see that there's another question. Um, so I um, am broadly interested in looking at trauma experiences, emotion dysregulation, and externalizing traits. So those that's like a very general way to say I'm essentially interested in looking at like risky behaviors or harmful behaviors that people may engage in after they've experienced something traumatic, especially as it's hinged to like emotional intelligence and emotional stability. Um, and uh, that and like knowing your research area, I, I was always, I feel like under this impression that like I needed to know exactly what I wanted to do. And I needed to like come in with like research questions and research project ideas. But, um, but that is not the case. Like as long as you have broad interest and you can communicate the depth of your interest um, in that area, that, that is more than enough. Um, the PhD program at John Jay, um, I think it's been a really good fit for me. Um, I was definitely, I have like research and clinical interests that are sort of bordering this line between like general psychology and forensic psychology. And I think that the program has really been able to offer um, like comprehensive training in both. And it was also really important to me that the program was going to um, allow me to sort of pursue clinical and research interests equally. Lots of PhD programs are heavily weighed on the research side, um, which wasn't appealing to me. So John Jay is like very 50-50 in terms of their clinical psych PhD program, which was appealing. Um, how did you build your resume, if you did, to become a good candidate for grad school? Um, I think the, the main things are sort of these like three areas that, that are probably obvious to you, but three areas to be thinking about. And that is like grades slash like academic stuff, um, research and clinical experience. And so I think it matters less like how, you know, like how impressive your like research experience is or like whatever, because those things are subjective and they matter differently to different schools and different advisors. I think what matters more is that you show that you've had like consistent interest in those things. So if there are ways that you can reflect on your resume or application that you were like, you know, committed to this research for like multiple years, or if you like did this volunteer position um, for like, you know, a, a longer period of time, um, clinical experience especially can be something that's really, really difficult to get without like these advanced degrees. Um, and so you can, that can be very flexible. I know people who just like worked at um, um, like the reception areas of hospitals and like that was, you know, that was like great clinical experience. Um, so, so be creative in, in how you get your experiences and, and try and sort of um, get a breadth so that you can cover those, those three domains. Can you apply to the PhD program at John Jay without a master's degree? Yes, definitely. Um, and different programs have like different requirements and also different um, just like preferences as well, I think. Um, and for that, I, I would say that like if you have a master's, I think that can definitely be a huge advantage because you know you might have a thesis that you can sort of hit the ground running with um, for your PhD work. But 
like honestly, I think if I, you definitely don't have to have anything, um, like for example, one person from my cohort just graduated from John Jay, like the year before she started in the PhD program. And I have other friends who just went straight out of undergrad to clinical psych PhD programs as well. Um, so that's definitely like possible and people do choose to do that. Um, the other thing is, I honestly think the best way to know if you really want to do a clinical psych program is to work for a couple of years, um, try and like find work in a psych lab. Um, there's been like more and more opportunities for like these post back positions um, in psych labs for people to either be coordinators for different like projects that labs have going on or be research assistants. And so I think doing that can also indicate to admissions that you know what it's going to be like, um, what like be, being in research and maybe being in clinical research specifically is going to be like, and you still want to do it. Um, where can we volunteer for research at John Jay? Um, I'm not totally sure about like the specific processes set up at John Jay, but I can talk more generally, like how I did it was um, at my university was if you just look up like um, Department of Psychology faculty or Department of Neuroscience faculty or whatever your specific interest is, you'll see the faculty that are normally like a part of the graduate program, but they want undergrad research assistance. And so you can go and when you look up information, a lot of faculty will actually have like a website where they have sort of a streamlined process for um, how undergraduates can apply to like be research assistants in their lab. Otherwise, you can also just email them and say like, hey, I'm really interested in learning more about the research that you're doing. Do you have any space in your lab for like an undergraduate to be um, a part of your lab? And faculty usually like really like that and you'll get a good response. Um, don't be offended if you don't get any response at all because that's also fairly common. Um, but yeah, just keep trying and, um, and be flexible in like what kinds of labs that you're willing to work in. Mm, how can I start volunteering or getting work experience with no prior experience? Yeah, that's a great question and it can definitely seem really daunting uh, to do that, but I don't think that the only like valuable experience you can have is if you started your like freshman year, your sophomore year. You can definitely make your research experiences meaningful, even if you start in your senior year. And um, I know that doesn't exactly answer your question, but to specifically answer your question, um, I think that the way you can like make a case for a faculty member to have you in their lab is less about what you've done before and more about how much you can convey your interest um, and your like motivation and your work ethic. Um, I think faculty are always just really excited to see undergrads who are excited in research and excited about the work that they're doing. And so if you can convey your interest and your excitement, um, that will go a long way. Um, I got also another question. Um, would a psychology minor have, have major differences as to a four-year psych major? Um, that's a good question. So I like my coursework and everything was very heavily neurobio. I was pre-med for a long time um, before I wanted to do a clinical psych PhD, but that really didn't hold my application back. Um, I just spoke about like the, the psych classes that I was able to take. Um, and also you can, if you have like specific like psych clinical experience or psych research experience, you can fill any gaps that you think there might be. So like if you haven't taken like a cognitive psych class, but you worked in a neuropsych lab, like you can, you know, you can, you can fill the gaps in different ways. Um, also, I also talk really fast. Um, and so if anyone like wants me to clarify anything or has any other questions or just needs me to slow down, I can do that too. Um, does anyone have any, like we'll give a, uh, one last question. Um, yeah, so thank you again for doing this. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, I know you have to run, so if you have to run, feel free to hop off, whatever. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for doing this. Um, and yeah. Yeah, of course. Um, I'm happy to do it. I am also going to throw my email in the chat, and then anyone can feel free to email me if you if you have any questions ever.
nice to see you all. Well, awesome. your photos at least. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, awesome. So the next up is going to be uh, Chelsea. She is from the uh, the FMHC program with uh, the Masters. So yeah, we'll let her introduce herself. Uh, hi guys, my name is Chelsea. Um, I graduated from Adelphi with my uh, bachelor's in criminal justice and philosophy. My degree in philosophy was like completely useless, but my degree in criminal justice was really helpful because um, I knew I wanted to do something there, but I didn't know what. I didn't want to be a police officer. I didn't want to be an investigator. So I was kind of lost in between of not knowing what to do. Uh, so one of my professors told me about like John Jay. And he told me about the forensic psychology department and the FMHC department. And I remember going to John Jay um, and meeting with the graduate advisor. And he told me all about the programs and I had to decide like which one was actually right for me. And I thought the forensic mental health counseling was perfect. Um, it's a great program that I wanted to do. And at the end of all of this, I get to get my license in mental health counseling, um, which is like the best part ever. Um, what the program basically like focuses on is like uh, interviewing, um, doing assessments and diagnosis. Um, it's the crossroad between like psycho psychology and law. So if you are interested in doing law um, and psychology, so then this program would be the best for you, I think. Um, the program also offers three tracks. Um, there's the externship track, which is where you just get to do your 600 hours of externship. There's also a thesis track. If anybody's interested in doing research, then this might be also good for you. Um, students get to do research with a professor and then write a thesis at the end of it. And then there's also a track where if you're interested in working with victims and trauma, um, there's also a victims track. I'm doing the externship track because I just, I don't really know what I want to focus on. I just want to be open to all of everything. Um, I believe next fall, I'm going to be starting my externship. It's in Manhattan. I'm going to be working at a clinic where I get to work with sex offenders. I get to counsel sex offenders, which is pretty interesting, but it's something that, you know, it's something. And I like to do that. So it's weird, I know, but I like to do that. Um, the program offers a lot of like electives. So depending on like what you're interested in, um, there's courses that you get to choose from. There's like substance abuse courses, um, working with children, working with families, working with domestic um, abuse. And then you have like your required courses, which like introduce you to the program, teach you how to read the DSM, teach you how to, uh, the different modules to work with. Um, yeah, it's, I'm also a college assistant for the program. So like I oversee applications I help Dr. Raghavan, she's the program director of FMHC, um, go through the program. Uh, we do advisement sessions if you need help. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. I was kind of just like thrown into the program um, when I got uh, accepted because, you know, with COVID, everything happened, I lost my job. So when I saw the opening for the college assistant, I was just like on board, ready to go. But I was also a freshman in the program. So like, I didn't know anything and I had to like start from square one. Um, I needed advisement myself, but I was giving people advisement um, advice, but it was definitely worth it. And I love doing the program. Um, yeah, I see questions coming in, so I'm just gonna go off of them. What if we're interested in both masters? You're gonna have to do, uh, people usually, some students start with FP and then transfer over to the FMHC program. Like they take credits in FP and then transfer over but you can't do both at the same time. You have to do them separately. I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah. Uh, it definitely makes me hard. It's definitely gotten a lot more competitive because, I'm sorry, is FMHC hard to be accepted into? Uh, it's definitely gotten more competitive because uh, the GRE is no longer like, it's a required, but right now because of COVID, we're not really requiring it. So we're looking more into like student grades, how many credits of psych they have, if they're taking statistics, um, what grade they got in statistics. Um, it's not hard, but we definitely encourage you to apply. We don't want to discourage anybody. So yeah. Uh, yeah, John, John E. Engel got it. The FMHC program is just an extension. The, the major differences with FMHC, you're, it's four years, I believe. I don't, not four years, four semesters. Uh, more credits and then at the end of it you get your license um sp i think you just get your master's but i'll let sp talk about them um yes anybody else has any more questions i'll also like leave the 
department email if you have any questions there you can email us there i work with my co-partner there what are something that we can do to stand out since it's competitive um i believe we usually look at uh, personal statements if your personal statement is like super interesting and like yeah like we definitely want to hear why you're interested in the program and like why you want to pursue this degree but we're also interested in hearing about your story and that's something that stands out to us like student personal statements really stand out to us uh that's all i can really think of your recommendations as well we accept recommendations from professors and we also if you don't have enough professors we also do from like jobs supervisors managers so that's something also, I copied them all even. Um, okay, so any other questions for Chelsea? No? Okay, um, so you're you're able to stay on until 2.20, right? Yeah, I'll be here. I'll keep answering questions in the chat. Cool. So she'll be around. Uh, one more question just came in. If I'm enrolled in forensic psych, BA, NA, programming, can I transfer to Avenue C? Uh, no, you cannot transfer. You're going to have to finish your BMA program and then transfer and then apply to the FMHC program. But we do take your credits from the, your graduate credits from the forensic psych program. So you would have to do it separately. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Cool. Um, awesome. Thank you so much, Chelsea. Um, so up next, uh, we have uh, John. If you want to go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to. Um, so I'll, I'll sort of run through my um, last four years and, and where I am now and where I will be next year um, to give you guys sort of an idea. I was accepted into a clinical psych PhD program, which I'll be starting next fall. And that has been my goal for the last four years, ever since I graduated from undergraduate in 2017. Um, I also applied directly out of undergraduate. I thought that I would have a good chance because I knew nothing about the field. Turns out um, it was much more difficult than I thought, so I didn't get any interviews. So then for two years, I tried to get research experience by volunteering in a lab um, not affiliated with the college that I had previously attended, and also by gaining some clinical experience as a case manager, um, which was also a very difficult job to find. I applied to like 40 or 50 positions before I found one, and it wasn't even as clinical as I was necessarily hoping for. But then two years ago in 2019, I sent out another round of applications to clinical psych PhD programs, and I applied to 13 schools, and I had five interviews. And again, I did not get in anywhere. So at that point, I decided to attend John Jay's Forensic Psychology Master's Program to try to improve my resume and get more research experience to make myself in more competitive uh, PhD applicant. And so this, in, in the previous winter, um, I applied yet again for clinical psych PhD programs. This time I applied to 16 schools, got five interviews and got into one school, only one. So um, clinical psych PhD programs are very competitive and very difficult to get into. And um, as our first speaker said, sometimes you do need to show a little bit of resiliency if you if you really want to do that um, because it is among the most difficult uh, programs to get into i think in the country acceptance rate wise but yeah for the last two years i've been at john jay's forensic psych program um, i completed the dual track uh, which means that you complete both an externship as well as um, a thesis and I'm hopefully going to be finishing up my thesis in the next month. And I did my externship last fall. And I've just tried to get involved. I've tried to get involved in as many ways as possible so that I could get my resume looking as good as possible for clinical psych PhD programs. Um, and so, yeah, I can talk more if anybody has any questions about the application process to either the master's program or clinical psych programs in general. Um, but Kenny also, I think, has a somewhat similar experience to me, so it might be good to let him share as well first. Yeah, yeah, let's do that. Um, so, Kenny, do you want to hop in real quick? 
Yeah, definitely. Hi, everyone. Um, so my experience in this whole uh, graduate career is actually somewhat unique in that I actually did both my bachelor's and my master's in forensic psychology at John Jay. So, but I didn't do the BA MA program. And I, I think that's a very important detail in sort of like my story. So I did the usual four years in the undergraduate program. Then I applied to the master's program, which was another two years. Um, so I did each separately. I didn't do the BA MA program. Um, and, and it was important for me to sort of go down that route for me uh, because I knew from a very early on in undergrad, I wanted to get into a PhD program. Um, and I knew what John was sort of saying. It is one of the most competitive sort of programs to get into. And I, and I sort of knew that. And I was very, very aware of that. So I decided to sort of um, do the full track for both the undergrad and graduate program to get uh, research experience, to get to know people, um, to get to know myself, honestly. Um, because one thing that I, I think is really important for everyone to know is that in undergrad and within a master's program, you're really getting to know a lot about yourself as well, getting to know what works for you, what doesn't work for you, and that's okay. Um, there's a couple of things that did not work for me at all. And I was able to sort of figure that out in a very, um, you know, very supportive environment um, because we're all still students here, we're all still learning. And I think it's really important to give each other and ourselves like a break here and there and to just understand that we're still learning and we're, we're, we're part of the process and I'm still part of the process as well. Um, so as John mentioned, um, I'm also actually a wrapping up my second year in a PhD program in clinical psychology out in uh, Montclair State University um, in New Jersey. So uh, it, it's, it's like about an hour ride, train ride out of Penn Station. It's really close, it's, it's really, really accessible. Um, but I decided to go there for a couple of reasons. One, uh, location. I am not leaving the Northeast whatsoever. Ideally, I didn't want to leave outside of New York City, but you know, things happen. Um, also, because it's a forensic program as well, um, my research and clinical interests are in forensic psychology explicitly, and particularly within assessment. Um, so you might have heard that there are two different types of paths here. So you can go down the exclusively assessment route, and then you can go down the therapy route, or you can do both, you know, some people do both. Uh, but I'm going down the assessment route. Like my main interests are in forensic evaluations. Um, so that's like uh, violence risk assessments, uh, forensic evaluations for the court, um, you know, uh, expert testimony, um, so stuff like that. Um, and that's something that I sort of developed throughout my undergrad and graduate career um, because of my experiences. Within the master's program, I was in three labs, research labs, and in undergrad, I was in two labs. Um, so just so everyone knows and gets familiarized with like the professors um, at John Jay, I'll briefly sort of summarize the labs that I was in. Um, I was in Dr. Elizabeth Jetlake's lab. She does research on sex offenders and I'm still working with her um, running projects and publishing articles and conference presentations. I was in Dr. Diana Falkenbach's lab. Um, so she does a lot of work on psychopathy within um, the community um, setting. I was actually her lab manager for about three years um, and I joined her lab in undergrad. I was also in Dr. Patty Zaff's lab. She's no longer at John Jay, uh, but she was actually my thesis advisor. I did my thesis with her when I was in the MA program and she does a lot of research on forensic training, forensic evaluations, forensic bias, so stuff like that. In undergrad, I was actually, I also started off in undergrad in Dr. Rebecca Weiss's lab. Um, so it was, it was a very multicultural lab. Um, so I was all over the place. <laughs> That's honestly what the point is that I'm trying to make here. But that's also the other point too, because I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do, what I liked, what I didn't like. And so I was sort of like um, trying to see what research labs are out there. And as sort of everyone mentioned, the first thing I did was just email everyone. Honestly, I just shot my shot and I said, hey, are you looking for a research assistant? Um, and you know, sometimes I got a response back, sometimes I didn't, but I'm very grateful for the um, people who did uh, respond back because that's literally how I got the research experience. Um, so that, that, that was a lot of information. Uh, I think John and I can go sort of got back and forth with the questions at this point, um, but I'll also put in my email address just in case anyone want, else wants to sort of, um, you know, reach out as well. Awesome, yeah, thank you both. Um, so yeah, if you guys have any questions for John or for Kenny, feel free to put them in the chat or feel free to unmute yourself, um, use a little hand raise emoji, uh, whichever way. 
So I think Angela's question was probably for Kenny, and it was how how did you know that this was the specific field that you wanted to pursue? Yeah, so I was introduced to psychology in general in high school. Uh, I took AP psychology, and it was actually one of my most favorite classes. Um, honest, most of it, honestly, because of the the teacher. Um, I think he was he was very uh, uh, growth minded. Um, so he was he was a, a fantastic teacher. But I was introduced to psychology in high school, and um, I was really interested in sort of, uh, as everyone, this may sound really cliche, but, um, you know, the criminal mind, I was really interested in sort of like law enforcement, um, very law oriented. Um, and I, as I was going through the college application process, I found, oh, John Jay College of Criminal Justice. Oh, this sounds great. Um, what's funny is that I was actually a criminology major at first. Like I didn't come in as a forensic psych major. I actually switched my majors. Uh, mainly because I thought criminology was uh, exactly what I wanted to do. But then after learning a little bit more and, and talking to the advisement center, talking to sort of the mentors I had, um, I found that forensic psychology was actually a better fit for me. So that's how, that's how I wanted to go in specifically. In terms of like my research interests and clinical interests, like I said, I, through the work that I did through research labs, um, that really solidified what I wanted to do um, uh, in, in the future. Um, so I see, why did you choose the MA in forensic psychology instead of the joint BA MA program? Um, so the BA MA program is accelerated. Um, so you get to sort of graduate a year earlier, but that also means that you, can have, you have to do everything a year earlier as well. And that I, for me, I, 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 I kind of wanted to take my time with it. Um, I, I have more of a, I, I wanted to take my time with it and I didn't, I didn't necessarily feel prepared to really thrown into graduate level programs I, when I was a junior. Um, and as a junior, how old was I? Like 20. Uh, I, at that point, I knew I was not ready to start any graduate classes. It was not for me, I was not ready. So that was really the main reason as to why I didn't do the BA MA program. Um, I see, which professor did you reach out to research in psychopathy at John Jay? Uh, that's uh, Professor Diana Falkenbach. Um, she's actually on sabbatical in the fall. Uh, what that means is that she won't be uh, teaching. I don't think she'll be, I don't, I'm not sure what her lab is doing. Ironically, I'm still listed as her lab coordinator on the, on the website, um, but I, I don't know who the lab coordinator is um, right now. Um, so John, I'm not sure if you know who it is now, if you can maybe put in their information for students who are interested. Yeah, I can do that. Um, also, there is another faculty member, um, Dr. Gillian gross Pfeiffer that does some psychopathy work um, in John Jay's forensic psych program, although it's, it might be a little bit more neural um, associated. And I'm gonna put right now in the chat um, the link to the faculty um, website that describes all the faculty research interests. But then, yeah, I can also share Dr. Falkenbach's current um, lab coordinator, although the lab is really sort of on a hiatus with her um, impending uh, what's it called, sabbatical coming up. I also do want to mention, I, again, you know, uh, I, I, don't, I don't mean this to sound, sound uh, a, a little uh, snobbish, but um, the website that John um, just linked, I created that website. <laughs> I was actually within, um, I was actually part of the master student research group when I was in the forensic psychology um, program. So I created the Instagram page, which I'll link as well, or John can link that as well as, as I'm talking. I created the Instagram page, the website there. Um, so, you know, I, I just wanted to throw that out there. Uh, but relatedly, I think that's also something important to also mention as well. I kind of threw myself in a lot of leadership positions and so like professional development positions as well. I think that also helped me become a very competitive applicant. Um, uh, having that on your resume, in addition to like the academics, the academic stuff is important. But what advisors and, and people who are in charge of the admissions committee want to see is that you, you're doing more than that. Um, you know, constantly learning, uh, constantly um, developing your leadership skills, constantly developing your professional development skills, and broadly defined, such as like public speaking, um, being able to articulate yourself, you know, stuff like that. Um, so in addition to everything that I was doing, I was also sort of seeking a, a lot of leadership opportunities as well. Um, and I also forgot to mention that I'm also an adjunct as well at John Jay. So although I was at, I was at academically at John Jay for six years, um, I came back <laughs> as, as an adjunct. So I'm teaching Psych 101 and research methods and some of my students are in, are in the room as well. So shout out to my students as well. Hey. <laughs> um, 
Okay. Um, yeah, Kenny, I'm actually part of the current MSRG. I don't know if you knew that, but we're very indebted to all the work that you put in. Thank you so much for all that. Um, Thank you. Yeah. And then to respond to a question from, I might mess up this pronunciation, but IFRA, IFRA, um, she asked, any volunteer or work experience outside of John Jay? If so, how did you find them? Um, I can speak personally. Um, I found a job as a case manager in Ohio after graduating from undergrad. Um, and like I said, I, I'd applied to many, many positions before finding that one. And it wasn't necessarily as clinical as I hoped for, but it was working directly with a clinical population. So that was good. Um, I volunteered to mentor a patient at a local forensic hospital, which was just once a week, sort of one-on-one, -on -one, but it got me in the door and it got something on my resume. And then I've also been um, working for about the last year and a half on the suicide hotline in New York City. Um, Samaritans of New York um, is the organization. And that's been a really a great experience in active listening skills and techniques of communicating with people in crisis. And, you know, I, I don't know if those things necessarily made any difference on my application to PhD programs, but that's sort of the things that I got involved in, in addition to um, volunteering in a research lab at a, at a local college in Ohio um, that I made a connection at. Um, so I see a question also from uh, IFRA. Um, this is for all three of you guys. Uh, so they said, how was the application process for MA and FP or FMHC, uh, mainly regarding the GRE? I answered it before, but I think uh, we were required to take the GRE um, before COVID. Uh, we required a 297, um, not the psych one, just the regular GRE. Um, we recommend that you take it twice, um, but I think for the fall, if you're applying for the fall, that we waived it, so I don't think you have to worry about that. Um, the application process wasn't that bad. Um, I just I would just suggest to like follow up with the professors or the uh, bosses that you ask to do recommendations so that they get them in because those are really important and we do look at them so yeah for the spring i have no clue yet i don't think we mentioned anything yet about the spring only fall only fall we are waiting it um so any other questions for the panelists Feel free to put them in the chat or um, you know, raise your hand or unmute yourself. I mean, in the meantime, I can also sort of uh, talk about um, a clinical experience because when I applied to my PhD program, I had zero formal clinical experience. I have never seen a patient in my life. <laughs> I have never treated anyone before in my life before um, and I still got in. Um, and what's interesting there is that I, I think what helped me get into a program was the fact that I had a lot of research experience. And I think it's kind of uh, important to differentiate both the forensic psychology MA program and the forensic mental health counseling program. Um, the forensic psychology MA program is a little bit more research inclined and their whole selling point is to prepare you for a PhD in clinical psychology. It's not license eligible, meaning that once you finish the MA program in forensic psychology, you're not eligible to, uh, to apply for a license. Whereas for the forensic mental health counseling program, it's more of a terminal degree in that once you graduate from that program, you can apply for a license, you're eligible, and then you can start working from, from that point. Um, I mean, if you wanna go into a PhD program, that, that's completely up to you, but the whole selling point, it, it's a bit more different. Um, so, uh, I see Alicia sort of said, is it possible to do forensic psychology for a PhD? Well, it depends on what you, how you define forensic psychologist, right? Um, with, with just an MA degree, um, you can provide therapy. What you can't do is diagnose, um, to my understanding. You need to have a PhD in order to diagnose someone. And with an MA degree, you have to be supervised by someone who has your PhD. So um, you'll receive like treatment planning from someone who has your PhD, and then it's, it's your job to sort of facilitate that treatment planning based on your training. Um, so you can, you can give therapy, you can work within like um, forensic settings, forensic mental health counseling. I mean, you can sort of um, provide therapy in a forensic setting uh, among different populations, juveniles, children, adults, um, 
with, with that uh, licensure. I'm not sure, Chelsea, if you have something else to sort of add to that as well. Um, oh, but never mind. <laughs> yeah, out. I'm about to leave. But yeah, good luck, everyone. Have fun. <laughs> if you have any questions, email the department. We'll be happy to meet with you or anything like that. Thank you so much, Chelsea. Thank you so much. Kenny, another question for you. Um, what is something you wish you knew before starting your PhD in, in psychology? Um, that's a pretty, it's tough to answer. Um, I guess I'll also sort of talk a bit about my background as well. Um, so I'm a first generation everything. Um, like my parents didn't finish like primary school even. So from like primary school, high school, college, undergrad, masters, and now in this program, um, I was the first. So I didn't necessarily have that kind of support back home. Um, you know, my parents sort of, they nodded their heads sort of like, like saying, yes, I understand. They didn't understand what was happening. Um, so um, it was tough that I, I, it was tough in the beginning because I didn't have that support um, back home. So one thing that I wish I would have done is finding more support, reaching out for help, um, utilizing the sort of connections that I've made to just reach out and ask like, hey, like I'm struggling with this. Is this something that you also struggled with? Nine times out of 10, everyone else has probably gone through the same thing as well. Um, I, I, there's one example about like um, being very nervous and having, uh, being very nervous before like a presentation. What's interesting is that I still get nervous even before I do a presentation. I was even nervous before coming onto this call <laughs> uh, because I knew there was gonna be people that had to be talking about that. But it's interesting that if you reach out and sort of like ask for guidance, you're gonna be shocked as to how many people have actually gone through that and how many people are still going through that. And the idea there is not necessarily to sort of, um, you know, some people are still going through it and that's not necessarily the point. The point is that having that support system, I think is the point. Having that, having those people that you can definitely email, having those mentors that you can sort of rely on, I think is the most um, important step there. And, and it wasn't for my mentors. I do not think I would be here um, now. Um, uh, again, Dr. Jetlag, Dr. Falkenbach and Patty Zaff, I think were definitely all part of that um, journey for me as well. Um, any other questions for the panelists? I see Alicia, Alicia sort of uh, said something about victims. Yeah, so um, Chelsea sort of mentions that they're within the forensic mental health counseling program, there's a victimology track. Um, that's actually really new and something that a lot of sort of um, instructors, uh, professors, researchers, clinicians are trying to advocate for, um, that there isn't enough clinical uh, focus on victims and survivors. Um, so the FMHC program is starting to do that by, uh, by um, creating this victimology certification. Um, and with the FMHC sort of program, you can also sort of provide um, therapy for victims. Again, across all ages, such as children, juveniles, adults, you know, wherever you want to sort of specialize. And I just put that uh, link in the chat if you guys wanted to check that out more. Um, Okay, um, any other questions or anything for, for Kenny or for John? Okay, um, awesome. So I guess we can start wrapping up then. Um, maybe just some closing thoughts on, you know, uh, your guys' experiences and anything you, I guess any advice you would, you would give people who are interested in graduate school. I mean, I would say don't rush, um, work, on your own schedule, don't work on someone else's schedule, right? Because um, I did the four years of undergrad, then I did the master's program, which was another two years, and then I took a year off. Um, so I didn't immediately apply to grad school. So there is this sort of, um, I don't know whose schedule this is, but apparently uh, the schedule is to um, do the four years, figure out what you wanna do, um, apply for it and then get in. That's generally not how things work um, for the most part. And I think it's, it's important to sort of ask yourself, like, what's your schedule? Um, what's the schedule that you want to work off of? And being able to differentiate between that schedule and then someone else's schedule that 
might be imposed on you and might be sort of uh, maybe the origin of the anxiety. I think that's a very uh, personal conversation to have with yourself. Um, but generally my, my, my broad sort of um, advice is to don't rush. I think you know yourself better than anyone else um, and, and follow that timeline instead. So yeah, we just got a couple of questions. Firstly, I'll, I'll take this one. Is it possible to work full time during your master's? Um, I would say it's it would be very, very difficult to do and to still complete your master's in two years, although there are people that are doing it. Um, and Brandon, it looks like you might have something to say there. I was just going to say, uh, I didn't I didn't work full time, but uh, for, in my work for the department, I was also working about 20 hours a week. Plus, I was working a second job on the weekends. So it's doable. It's just like, it's a lot because sometimes you feel like there's never enough hours in the day. So I would have, it definitely depends on you. If you think that you can, you, you can handle all that, it's doable. Um, you can also do like part-time classes. Um, it's definitely possible. Um, but yeah, I think just uh, kind of like what they're saying, it's, it's up to you. So it's, it's your time. Yeah, PhD programs, the length of PhD programs, that was another question. Um, I think generally five or six years and the, the fifth or sixth year is usually going to be an internship year where you haven't graduated yet, but you are working like quote unquote a real job, uh, hopefully, and getting paid, you know, not as much as you eventually will, but getting paid way more than your stipend, um, hopefully, ideally. Yes, had to, yes. Did you have to pay out of the pocket for your master's? Yes, they, uh, there's not too much funding there other than some scholarships here and there, but for the most part, that's a yes. Um, so quickly, um, are there any last, we probably have time for like one more question if anybody has it. Otherwise, um, oh, there is one question. Um, so they said, can you get paid for completing your master's or PhD? So, I mean, I guess in terms of your master's, uh, no, it's, it's kind of like, uh, you, you have to fund it yourself, but in terms of PhD, most, uh, kind of like Rado was talking about earlier, um, most PhD programs are fully funded, but some aren't. So it just depends on the program. And generally, but, oh, sorry. In, in oh, no, generally, yeah, go ahead. The information um, can be found on schools' websites regarding their funding. Um, some schools make you do more digging than others, but generally if you go to the student admissions data or something along those lines and you scroll down to the finance or funding section, it will tell you um, something about what, what they give students. So that's definitely a variable that you want to look for if you're applying to clinical psych PhD programs. Awesome. So um, I just want to say thank you to everybody for coming today. Thank you to John. Thank you to Kenny. Thank you to Chelsea. And thank you to Rada, who had to hop off early. Um, and yeah, but uh, I think this is very helpful for everybody. So thank you guys again. Um, and yeah, uh, everyone can just go ahead and drop their contact info in there um, in the chat. And feel free to reach out with any other questions you guys might have. Awesome.